We love Brother George, don't we? Thank you, Cale, for singing that song, He is Able. Because God can do more than we ask or imagine according to His power and His work with us. And thanks to all of Cale's family for bringing Stetson today. We're blessed by young families who are starting out with the commitment that what God has joined together is precious and sacred and wonderful. We want to raise your sons and daughters to the nurture and admonition of the Lord from the very beginning. God bless you in that. Well, going a few years later, you may have noticed a special glow from Oli and Judy Olson today, as this is their 52nd wedding anniversary. Isn't that tremendous? And he told me yesterday at the men's breakfast that they were very, very, very young when they married. And so I began looking through my archives. Could I find a photo of their wedding day? Well, I did the best I could. It's not actually <laughs> But you can certainly sense the anticipation of these two little ones who were actually the ring bearer flower girl at a wedding of some friends of ours years ago. And then I love this picture as the groom-to-be is sort of looking off, you know, what is yet to come. And then when the moment arrives, he's not quite so certain. <laughs> You know, we talk so often about encouraging marriage. What God can do with us, how we can learn and together aim for heaven, feast on His riches and His grace and His truth. And we often celebrate when a couple reaches a milestone like the Olsons have. At the same time, it's so important that we go back to the basis of what gives marriage its significance. And that is that in the very beginning, God made one man and one woman. He joined them together so that they became one flesh. And Jesus went back to that very start and said, Therefore, what God has joined together, man must not put asunder or separate. And in the age in which we live, it's more crucial than ever that we stress God's design, His intention, and His plan. Because the truth is that marriage is facing significant obstacles in the United States today. If you were to search online and put the word millennials and the word marriage, you would find that among those teenage and college age coming to adulthood in our nation, that 25% say they will never marry. That's the highest percentage in history. And about a quarter of unmarried young adults, ages 25 to 34, are living with a partner, according to the Pew Research. Kate Bolick, in an Atlantic cover story entitled All the Single Ladies, said, it's time to embrace new ideas about romance and family and to acknowledge the end of traditional marriage as society's highest ideal. A question was posed in a poll, quote, do you agree or disagree society is just as well off if people have other priorities than marriage and children? Half of all American adults agree. Ages 18 to 29, 67% agree. Those 30 to 49, 53%, and those ages 50 and over strongly supported traditional, biblical, God-given marriage. And then if you were to put millennials in the word religion, you would see what one of you sent me just a few days ago, that faith in God compared to years ago has seen a great drop in our culture that 75% more in the age group of 12th graders and college students said religion is, quote, not important at all in their lives compared to the 1970s. Compared to the early 80s, twice as many high school seniors, three times as many college students when they were asked their religion said none. What has led to the mega shift in our culture regarding marriage? We're aware that the United States Supreme Court has claimed the authority to determine whether two men or two women can be married. How did all this 
us go. Well, I've noted some things in my thinking, and perhaps you would add to them. They're not in a particular order. There's a loss of a Bible-based standard, a loss of an anchor and compass. It's evident in the overthrow of anti-sodomy laws in all the states of our nation, a rejection of absolute truth, a hatred by some of the Bible and all who believe it. Russell Moore said that for much of the 20th century, one had to at least claim to be a Christian to be, quote, normal. But this is no longer the case. Those who don't believe can say so and still find spouses, get jobs, volunteer with the PTA, and even run for office. The widespread acceptance of Darwinian evolutionary theory, if we're just graduated apes, why should we live any differently? Why practice fidelity to one member of the opposite sex for life? There's a loss of shame. Now two can cohabitate, switch partners, advertise personal clothing, <coughs> refer in the media to male and female body parts, offer sex-enhancing drugs on television, and there's no shame. There's the acceptance of sexual immorality with premarital sex and adultery and sometimes quote, anything goes between consenting adults. One author notes that the redefinition of marriage began decades ago when the link between sexuality and procreation was severed in our cultural imagination. And children became optional. People no longer saw that a primary purpose of a man and woman becoming one was to bring children into this world. And now we live in an age in which unborn children can be disposed of. And that devalues all human life, including the relationship and marriage. We're exposed to a barrage of bad examples, broken homes, celebrities, Hollywood, there's a lack of preparation for marriage as people often jump into it without thinking it through. Divorce has become easy, no fault matter. There's the pursuit of pleasure, the lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, the pride of life. Superficial relationships, lacking depth and commitment. There's a denial of history and sociology, missing the point that where marriage has been stable and happy and peaceful, not only have families flourished, but the entire environment, friendships, relationships, even the economy and the growth of society can be linked directly to stable marriages. You know, from time to time, you and I realize that even in our own number, there are those who marry with all good intentions. You sought to do the will of God. You put Him first. And your marriage did not make it. And it broke your heart as you sought to do what God said to do. And you stuck with it. And you still are today. And our hearts go out to you. We commend you for that. Love you. Pray for you. At the same time, those that have been through such pain recognize the importance of teaching what the Lord said. Because you know that His design, His setup, is the way that's right the way that's true and the way that's good. And I'm convinced one thing that's happened to marriage in America is that in churches we don't talk enough about what God has joined together. It's a subject that's easily avoided that we might turn away from, and yet it's so pivotal. This quarter, Sunday mornings, I'm teaching the junior and senior high young people what an outstanding group they are. They are Bible questions. And one that came to the surface was, what does the Bible teach about divorce? And it's so important that we let Jesus answer that question for us. There are two passages in Matthew. The one in chapter 5 is in the Sermon on the Mount, where he said, you've heard, whoever divorces his wife, let him give her a certificate of divorce and send her away. But I say to you, Whoever divorces his wife and marries another except for sexual immorality commits adultery. And then in chapter 19, where we're going to go now, if you would, the question is asked by the Pharisees, intending to trap him in his answer. There was so much debate then as there is now. As people wanted to justify the choices they made and the sins and the wrongs in their lives, 
There's a large crowd with the Savior. Some, even many, might be touched or offended by his response. And yet he was willing to hear and answer one of the toughest of questions, though it was from a false motive. And they were trying to ensnare him. They came and they asked, is it lawful? They were looking for authority. They were asking the right question. They weren't talking about some man-made law, but the ways of God. And when they said in verse 3, for any cause at all, they may have been reflecting on the debate going on in Jesus' time between two prominent rabbis. One who said only if the spouse was unfaithful sexually could divorce occur. And the other said even if she just burned the toast or you found someone more attractive or interesting, that was a legitimate reason. And with all of this going on, Jesus comes to them and he says, in the beginning, haven't you read? And in that question, there's an implication. You ought to have read. You do know, don't you, how everything started? And then he quotes from chapter 1 of Genesis and chapter 2, ties them together. That God made male and female. One of each. He created them and said, A man, one man, shall leave his father and mother and cleave to his one wife. And they shall become one flesh. If we can answer the question, who invented marriage? Whose idea was it? Then we can understand its nature, its quality, its character. But when we remove God, when we rewrite the beginning, so it was a series of accidents and coincidences and some explosion that came out of nowhere and we're just a group of random molecules. We can't explain. And this is the crisis in our land right now. Why would one man and one woman commit themselves to each other through thick and thin, sacrifice and pain, ups and downs, hills and valleys, no matter what, till death do us part? If it's not God who took a man and a woman and caused them to be one. Therefore, verse 6, they're no longer two, but one flesh. And you and I know Genesis 2, 24 states that. And then verse 25 in Genesis 2, the man and his wife were both naked and were not ashamed. The marital relationship was an expression, though it was not the totality of the oneness that God gave them. It was a oneness of spirit, a oneness of mind, definitely connected with the physical union. The world wants to reverse that and put the physical first, the attraction, the chemistry, the desire, so that it can be tempting for two to come together without starting where God starts. God specially made the woman for the man. Oh, what must it have been like for Adam to see all those animals? Elephant won't work. Giraffe, way too tall. Hamster, I don't think so. And then the woman. And then the original language, Adam says something like, aha, this is it. God made the man needing the woman. Man, he designed us lacking a counterpart Missing our other half, our better half. And he made the woman to complement, to be a helper suited, fit for the man. And when the two fit together in every way, that is God's design.
sign. And God said, one flesh. And Jesus drew from that the inference that what God has joined together, let man not separate. Well, there's a follow-up question they ask, isn't there? Why did Moses, verse 7, command to give her a certificate of divorce and send her away? Well, the passage they're drawing on is Deuteronomy 24, 1 through 4. Perhaps you'd like to turn back there. You read the entire section and there's not one command to divorce. Rather, it's a series of if statements. If, 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 then this. If a man marries, if he finds some indecency, if he divorces, if he gives her a certificate, if she marries another, if that second husband puts her away, if, 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 then the first husband cannot take her back again. Well, they drew out of that something it never said as if there were a command, an authorization, an encouragement for a man for whatever reason at all. Remember, that was their question. Can a man divorce his wife for any cause? What would Deuteronomy 24? It reminds us of what many call cognitive dissonance. And that is an attempt to justify, rationalize, excuse decisions and actions and choices so that what we did is okay. So perhaps the Pharisees have this leading that they're wanting Jesus to say, it's all good. Whatever you want, go for it. And of course, that would get him in trouble with one side. On the other hand, if he's very strict and he sides with those whose interpretation is this or that, he will offend the others. Jesus doesn't even discuss originally Deuteronomy 24. He goes back to Genesis, back to the beginning. But then he does respond in verse 8 of Matthew 19. No command. He says, Moses permitted. We might say the scripture regulated something that was happening that men were doing. And Deuteronomy 24 basically says, if you do this, 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 these are the consequences. So it's not a suggestion. It's not something that prompts it or pushes it. It's rather showing what the outcome will be. Here's such a key for you and me. Jesus said, because of your hardness of heart, Moses permitted you to divorce your wives. But from the beginning, it has not been this way. I read this passage, and I want to be soft, gentle, kind, teachable. I don't want any callousness or harshness or roughness to get inside of me. Because it occurs to me that that's where so much sin originates. I have to have my will. Look at Eve and the fruit that she ate and gave to her husband and all that came about as the outcome of that. And I can be and you can be so egotistical, so proud, so self-willed. And then we wonder why our relationships aren't as vibrant and warm and strong as they ought to be. Oh, in our age, how important it is that we watch our heart, that we guard it, and we submit it to God. And because of that, we continue to show the spirit that strengthens that special bond. Ever since I was a boy, I've enjoyed tinkering with radios and televisions. I can remember, can any of you, the old vacuum tubes? I would take an old unit and replace the tube and put it in and wait for it to heat up and then hopefully hear something or see something. Maybe there was a loose wire or a broken switch or plug. Now they're too advanced for me to do much with them. But now when I look at the back of a computer or radio, I see a note that says, do not remove this screw. It's tempting to try it, isn't it? It's kind of like those little tags on the, uh, the, the 
pillows on your bed, do not remove this bed. Tag under penalty of law. You know, I wonder if I pull it off, will anybody come? You know, will I be arrested if something happened? But now I realize that if I loosen that screw that's do not touch the screw, something happens inside of that device that I can't fix from the outside. It's attached to something within. And it's not part of taking off the case. It's going to affect the insides. And in Scripture, there are things that God has said, don't touch this screw. And so because I respect the manufacturer, I do not loosen what he has tightened. And I don't want my hard heart to cause me to do that way. And then in verse 9, as we've noted, here's the whoever and accept that to divorce and marry another except for sexual immorality is to commit adultery. Those words are not hard to understand, are they? That God intends marriage to be permanent and that when Jesus was asked, he gave one exception. He shows us the importance of sexual purity in marriage. And that it is so closely tied with the overall intimacy and union and holiness of the relationship that is to be placed in the very highest regard and protected with all that we have. You know, there are so many questions people ask. Well, what if, and what if, and what if? Discussions take place that go on and on and on. I've come to respond simply this way. Two people want to be married. I ask them, read Matthew 19. And say, Is your marriage according to what Jesus taught in Matthew 19? Because I don't have the authority to tell what marriage is to you. There's no church or eldership, but this is not in our hands. And so we go back to what Jesus said and try to affirm it in love and kindness, but with conviction is very important for us, even more and more and more as so much is fighting in our world. It occurs to me that what God has joined, He has designed and He has defined. He's the one who can direct it and protect it bless and sustain it. God-given marriage glorifies Him and enriches us. It's not good for man to be alone. And a husband-wife relationship can reflect Jesus Christ in the church. It produces stable children and a stable culture. And even the secular press recognizes that truth that the environment in which a child is raised by his own mother and father, there's a greater likelihood of that child growing up with a security and a sense of identity and purpose. That confirms the truth of Scripture, doesn't it? And tells us that God knew what He was doing all along. People are healthier who stay happily and faithfully married. Their quality of life, even their financial status, there's so many things that are affected as a result. At the same time, the enemy is out to pull apart every man and every woman. Sin distorts and defiles that which God has made pristine and beautiful. Selfishness and pride lead to tugs of war and conflict and Satan loves every bit of it. What God is joy, we will protect. We will affirm. We will celebrate. And we will continue to strengthen that relationship which goes back into the very, very first chapter of all the Bible. We're going to proclaim it. We're going to affirm it. We're going to teach and teach and teach and encourage and exhort. We're going to model that plan for our young people. And we're going to make sure in the home 
that dads talk to sons and mothers to daughters and vice versa to clarify God's truth. And we're going to show the world, even an unbelieving world, who God is by living as those whom God has joined. Our relationship with each other is really a byproduct of our relationship with Him. When we talk about what God has joined, look at the lengths to which God has gone that we might be joined to Him. Look at how far He reached, how low the Son of God stooped for the glory of heaven so that we might be the bride of Christ. Does that describe you today? Oh, there's a wedding that could take place when you might respond this morning. Confessing your faith in Jesus as the Christ, the Son of God. Entering into His death and resurrection through baptism for the forgiveness of your sins. And then join to Christ. Live that way until you meet Him face to face. If you have a concern, a need, an area of sin, a burden, something with which we could share with you today, won't you come? Let's stand and sing.